Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? Is Christy? Oh, yeah. We're going to start this morning with our gathering song, and it's out of the Chalice Hymn on uh, number 277. Christians, we have met to worship. Would y'all like to stand for this? this morning. Um, March 9th is the stewardship meeting, I'm guessing. Uh -huh, two okay, at 2 o'clock. Uh, March 9th also is Bible study at noon. Everybody is welcome to come. And then also next Sunday is the 13th, um, or is that two weeks from now? No. Next Sunday is the board meeting. So I mean, we are all welcomed at the board meeting as well. Uh, does anybody else have any other announcements? No? Yes. Well, I want to, yeah. Gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. Gifts and Spirits? Gifts of the Spirit. Oh, Gifts of the Spirits. Okay, and also I want to thank everybody that came um, this past Wednesday to Connections Church. Those that came, it was a great service. Um, there was four different congregations there meeting. Um, and it was. There was a nice, nice amount of people there, I thought. I thought Don's message was perfect for the situation that we were in. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, 
Yes, Dawn is a great person. I love working with her out in the community. Absolutely. Um, our next song, call the worship song, is um, in your is Majesty number fifty. Are we are we standing? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, it is in the child's. find it in your bulletin or you may follow up on the on the board the mighty one speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting keep not your silence before us O God but let the heavens declare your righteousness gather to me my faithful ones all you have made a covenant with me we offer you our sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving let us worship. Morning by morning you awaken us, O God. Day by day you show us your wondrous love. The words of your commandments fall fresh upon our listening ears. We heed your wisdom and your re we are renewed by your word. You surround us with countless acts and tell us of your majesty. We are struck by your goodness as we are refreshed in your spirit. Come, dwell among us. And through Christ, let us praise you. You are the God we worship and adore. Amen. Amen. Oh, come on, Addie. It's your turn to come up here.
Oh, look! There's five little ducks. One, two, three, four. Five little ducks went swimming one day over the hill and far away. Mother duck said, quack, 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 but only four little ducks came back. One, two, three, four little ducks went swimming one day over the hill and far away. Mother duck said, quack, 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 but only three little ducks came back. One, two, three little ducks went swimming one day over the hill and far away. Mother duck said, quack, 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 but only two little ducks came back. Two little ducks went swimming one day Over the hill and far away Mother duck said, quack, quack, quack But only one little duck came back One little duck went swimming one day Over the hill and far away Mother duck said, quack, quack, quack but no Sad mother duck went out one day over the hill and far away. The sad mother duck said, quack, 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 and all the five little ducks came back.
as we come to a time of prayer, we have several that we're going to remember in prayer. And in particular, we're going to remember Claire here. Let me include these others. Remember Shirley and Don Forrest? They wanted me this last week. I went to see them and they wanted me to tell you how much they love you and how much they miss coming. But uh, things happen and uh, their kids took the car away. What? Yep. What? So they took the car away from the forest. And so they, they wanted me to tell you. Uh, it's not. They didn't want the car taken away. They wanted to keep coming to church, but they said, you know, we're not going to be able to come. Because you know, they took the car away. Somebody come and get me, I guess. So let's remember them in prayer. Betty Fugit's funeral will be on the 20th, and I have asked that uh, Casey come and preach for me, not next Sunday, but the next Sunday on the 20th. We're going to have, go up to Matador and have that memorial service so please remember them in prayer. Dave Baum went to the doctor this week and Rita went back to the hospital this week but she's home again so please remember both of them as they deal with their illnesses and Sharla also still recovering at home and of course the Bill's, Bill Mills family is mentioned in here in their grief remember them in prayer and their losses. The Ukrainian people of course everything's changing rapidly and getting more and more dangerous all the time. So let's remember them in prayer. And then, of course, there is also a men's walk to Emmaus that's coming up. We have training this afternoon, so remember us in our training. And as we continue to recruit people to help us, I think we've already still got about 12 men already signed up for that walk to Emmaus coming up. But also this being the beginning of Lent for you to concentrate and remember in these next seven weeks to contemplate Think about your devotion to him, rededicating ourselves to God. That's what the time is designed for. So I'm going to leave this as we pray, but Claire, come on down here at the altar. And those of you that would like to come up and lay hands on him, you are welcome to come up and lay hands on him. Join us together as we recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing as we prepare for the Lord's Supper.
this storehouse and that you will respond by opening the windows of the heaven and send down blessings upon blessings. Please give as your heart desires. Father, we love you and we thank you for the offering, the opportunity of giving of ourselves, Lord, representation of the giving of our holy world, which is part of this season, which is really part of our dedicating ourselves to you. Thank you for those who serve in this church, Lord, in the many ways that they do and the many ways that they do, serving and giving of themselves, Lord, in committee work and preparation of communion and in the Father's celebration and leading us in worship. Thank you for Christian. We ask earnestly your blessing as we continue to serve you and as we dedicate ourselves, Father, in a sense of communion and of prayer during this season of revival, dedicating ourselves to serving you, to even sacrificing ourselves. We love you for the opportunity, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Appropriate as we begin the season that we are beginning, that we read about the crucifixion from John chapter 19, beginning with verse 17, these verses. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with two others, one on each side of Jesus, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews... Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. <clears throat> and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man was claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one place from top to bottom. Let us not tear it, they said to one another. Let us decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, his, this disciple took her into his home. Love expressed historically and classically and clearly in the crucifixion of Jesus, always to be a symbol to us of self-giving love. It's a tool that you and I use in the scripture to instruct us of what self-giving love can do. Humility was declared by the cross as a prime quality of personality. Christian personality. Humility. I've been using the train as an illustration as we've talked about history, God's story, and the mystery of my story combining together into the purposes of God. 
We use the engine to represent that great wisdom of God, God taking the initiative to save us and God taking the initiative through history to always deliver us. God will still take the initiative in all things that happen in this world to deliver us in ways that we never imagined. We can only sit and wait. Something that is a classic axiom of scripture is the waiting. And waiting is not an easy thing. Learning to wait is a hard thing. But you and I have to learn to wait. Wait in deliverance. Wait in healing, as Claire prayed for today. Waiting for that healing to come to Claire. Waiting for the answer to our prayers. Waiting for God to deliver us from tyrants in the world and from a world situation. There is always waiting involved. That waiting takes time and we often become apathetic when the waiting continues and we don't get what we want. Waiting is for us to be able to participate. His story and my story meeting. Us to participate in the story of our journey with God. I've shared with you a couple of times already about that big engine that's found up in Amarillo. I'm going to be going up to Amarillo this next week just to deliver my taxes to my tax man. So I may go buy that engine to go see it again. It's in downtown Amarillo. Great big old 5,000. Engine number 5,000. It is enormous engine, a workhorse that's on a piece of track there in the center of Amarillo. If you walk up to it, it is frightening to walk up to. Still think about it, and I get heebie-jeebies up and down my spine as I think about it, walking up to that big old engine because the wheels on that engine are taller than I am. It is an enormous engine, a steam engine, but it is silent. When you walk up to it, it's not moving. It's sitting there silent. Reminds me of the potential energy that God gives to us, but it also reminds me of waiting. You and I have to wait for that engine to start, the engine of of history to continue on. And the reason why we have to wait is because the coal car to that engine is yours and my willingness and our competence in understanding the work of God are willing for eternal things to be overshadowing the earthly things and for our willingness for us to take the freedom and the discipline to pray and wait upon God. That coal car will eventually feed that engine and the engine will get started. God wants us to participate. That's why it was exemplified in the man God, Jesus becoming flesh and dwelling among among us. He became an illustration, an eternal illustration, how that God and you and I work together in his history and in our great mystery of our stories. God wants us working with him, working together. That's what this time of the year is to remind us of. We need to go to God in prayer, not to take it for granted, but to go to God in prayer and say, God, is there any wicked way in me that needs to be corrected? And also, Lord, empower me to be able to do what you're calling me to do. What have you called me to do? What what are you calling me to do? It's a time yearly that we set aside in the Christian year for us to be able to remember to go to God in prayer and ask God to remind us of our callings. You and I, have a tendency to want to make everything about us. But it's really, we're created to glorify him in self-giving love. That's why there will be a well done, thou good and faithful servant when we reach the kingdom because we're designed to glorify him. And by glorifying him, that's where the well done comes from. Even church leaders can find themselves preferring to be continuously needed themselves rather than equipping others to mature the church to the place that they don't need us. I'm reminded of that over and over again. It was the tragedy of the mission effort in the early years of missionary missions that the missionaries wanted to be needed. And so when they went on the mission field, they had a tendency to make it all about them and so that everything was centered on them and they didn't mature and grow the church leaders so that when, in the case of communist nations, those leaders were sent out, told to leave, they hadn't matured the people enough to be able to take over the duties and to lead them. That's what you and I are required to do where we're not missed. I like it. I actually do if uh, every once in a while a preacher is late for a service or late for a uh, meeting that uh, people don't worry about it. Uh, we, We can get along without a preacher. 
Any old stick will do for a preacher. We get along fine. That's good. A church should. A church should be able to get along because the idea is to equip, equipping people, equipping the body of Christ. The joy of a true servant is not power and control and acclaim and comfort and position, but it's service. The opportunity to serve and the opportunity to go with what comes along with it, and that is suffering that comes along with it. You and I as leaders in the world because we are that different humanity as Christians, we are leaders in the world or to help the world in the time of chaos, to try to alleviate that chaos, to try to bring some comfort to people and some encouragement. Matthew 10, 39, whoever finds this life and will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Everyone who has left houses and brothers and sisters and father and mother and children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. It is akin to that commandment, you shall honor your father and mother. It's a commandment that's said in the scripture with promise. The promise is that it will go well with you if you will take that which is your heritage and be glad of it. To be glad you're where you're at. To be glad you do what you do. To be glad that he's placed you where you are. To be glad of the journey that God has given you, which includes trials and tribulation and pain and trouble. See, I don't like it. Neither does anybody. But we are to glorify God by it. For his plan is being fulfilled through us and we don't see it. That plan is a miraculous plan, a beautiful plan. There's a beautiful passage of scripture found in that story of Daniel in Daniel chapter 4 where there is a waiting that's involved there. And that waiting is for Nebuchadnezzar. Let me read you a portion of that out of chapter 4 of Daniel. To the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at the home of my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. And I was lying on my bed. The images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. And when the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, and they found, I found that they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods are in him. He tells Daniel the dream, and Daniel says, give me some time. And Daniel goes to pray about it, and time passes. And Nebuchadnezzar begins to get a little impatient about it all. But eventually, Daniel comes to him and he says, Nebuchadnezzar, this is what your dream is about. Then Daniel, skipping ahead to verse 19, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time. And his thoughts terrified him. And so the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries... The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having a nesting place in its branches for the birds of the air. You, are king, are that tree. Then he goes on to telling the rest of the dream. The rest of the dream, he says, that you will fall down on all fours, and you will start walking around like a beast beast of the field and you'll remain like that for a while until God finally heals you and once he has healed you you will honor God sure enough it comes the dream is fulfilled in the latter part of chapter 4 and then when he is finally restored he again makes a proclamation his dominion is an eternal dominion his kingdom endures from generation to generation all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hands or say to him, what have you done? He is in charge. 
What he does and how he does it is his own way. You and I find the same thing is true in our lives. Often God does things and we don't imagine or can we understand even why God has allowed what he has allowed. The other day in our Bible study, uh, Don was there and we started talking about how that people get discouraged when there are so many things that happen in their lives that they cannot understand. One man told a story about a minister that he knew and that minister ministering here in the, the United States lived in comfort but then he went overseas and overseas he found people starving to death and a child starved to death right in front of his eyes. And he left the faith. How can a God allow such things to happen he said didn't return does that happen yes it can happen you and I are reminded and this time of the year is a time to remind us of that that God does things different than what we expect there will be people who will say you know uh, it looks like the old uh, premillennial, premillennial dispensational interpretation of the book of Revelation. Don't worry about those words. They're just two bits. They're worth about 25 cents a piece. It's coming true. The kingdom of the north is rising and the kingdom of the north will attack. Well, if that happens, fine. Doesn't matter to me how God ends the world. But if it doesn't happen, disappointed people will lose their faith over it. It didn't happen like I thought it was going to happen. In fact, you might find prophecy coming true. I dare say if the uh, leader of the Soviet Union, Russia, suddenly repented and became a Christian, people would gripe about it next Sunday. Because it didn't happen the way they thought it was going to happen. They were ready for things to end. Now and then people will say, you know, Jimmy, I'm glad you're a Christian. I think you're just barely going to get to heaven, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the important thing is that I'll be there, I think. I may have to stand in the corner for a long time, but I'll be there. And they'll say, well, we'll be at the wedding feast, won't they? And they'll say, yeah. And I, th I said, and I think my place will be right between Charles Manson and Adolf Hitler. And they said, they won't be in the kingdom. And I said, Mm, don't count on that the power of Jesus is very strong and the power of Jesus is going to get you to heaven isn't it <laughs> I said well I hope so I said I do too and I would say you're getting there on the skin of your teeth too but you'll get there because of the power of Jesus Jesus can do anything he is as Nebuchadnezzar declared God can do anything he does what he wants to he accomplishes what he wants to in this world. He doesn't do it our way. He does it his way. And sometimes there's even suffering involved. How would you like to suddenly become an animal? To be thrown down on all fours and have to live in a cave? Run around, grow hair all over you. Nails like Nebuchadnezzar. That's the way it's described. He grew nails. Long, long claws. And had hair all over him. And ran around and lived in a cave for a while. Because God was trying to humble him. And he did. When I was in the ninth grade, I still remember over at Nimitz Junior High School, us getting our history books, and it was world history. Started in the ninth grade, you had world history. I'm an old guy. That's we had world history in the ninth grade. And I remember opening it up, and there was a place in that world history book where this quote from Daniel chapter 4 was in that history book. As it talked about how that in the history of the world as we know it, King Nebuchadnezzar actually submitted to the Hebrew God. They removed it eventually. You know, the history book didn't have that in it anymore. After a while, somebody complained. But it was there. I'll never forget that. In my history book at school, a piece of scripture out of Daniel chapter 4. When we abandon our call to service, we become like brute beasts. Love is loyalty to people and principles and priorities. Priorities that we have. We can become like brute beasts when we neglect it. Listen to this passage from Psalm chapter 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. 
They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their peoples turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their final destiny. Sure you, surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down in ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one wakens, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom I have in heaven but you. And earth has nothing I desired besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all of your deeds. It is God that we plan when we serve, who plans our comings and our goings. It is God to whom we give thanks after he has accomplished all that he accomplishes in us. Give praise to God, honor to him, praise be to him. That's what we are designed to do. Even in what appears to be suffering, even what appears to be a plan that has failed, God will accomplish his good. There was an experience that I had, and I want to share that experience with you. This week, I'm going to Presbytery. Uh, I'm required still as a Presbyterian minister, an ordained Presbyterian minister, still required to go to Presbytery, or I have to give an excuse why I'm not there. And they want to see my face for some reason, and they want to see everybody else that's there, and they'll give me some assignments, I'm sure. But in going to it, it reminds me of a duty that I was given while by part of that Presbytery while I was still pastor over at St. Andrew. And that was that there was an argument that was taking a place in a church uh, in a town not far from here, another Presbyterian, Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And I was the uh, chairman of the uh, ministry to churches, to the congregations. And so they gave me the responsibility of helping mediate what was going on in that church. And it was a difficult thing. Went there several times. There was all kinds of trouble. There were people who were so angry with their pastors and so angry at the church that they just spit like serpents the things that they would say about each other. The last meeting that we had where we decided to give these people the opportunity to be able to say what they wanted to say about the congregation because the congregation was out of money. They were fixing to sell the building. They weren't sure what they were going to do. And we were still making decisions about it all. And so we had this meeting so that these people could say their piece about what they felt like. These three men in particular came in one by one. And as they came in, they sat down, and it was some of the nastiest stuff I have ever heard people say about each other and about their church. And as each one got through, one man would get through, and he would say, and now I'm going to leave, and I will never darken the doors of this place ever again. And he would get up and leave. And the next one would come and sit down and would go all over again. He would call them all kinds of names. And he would say that you, this is a wrong place, that God is not here. This is a wicked place. And they did all kinds of horrible things about them. And then he said, and I will never be back. I'm leaving and I will never be back. And he got up, yeah, and walked out. Then the third one did his business. And that business was just as horrible. And then he got up and walked out. And after he walked out, the leader of the church that was there, he said, Jimmy, can we have a time of prayer now? I said, yeah, we sure need it. Let's do. Let's have a time of prayer and pray about what God is going to do for us. And it was one of those beautiful moments that you didn't create, that you didn't cause, that simply happened. 
And, and the only way I can describe it to you is that suddenly Jesus walked in the door. And a calmness and a comfort came over the whole place. And in the prayers, we felt a sense of hope like we've never felt before. And I thought, you know, once evil leaves, you know, God comes back. It was one of the most beautiful and spiritual experiences that I've had in 50 years of ministry. Magnificent. We even, after the prayer was finished, we all had to sit silent for a little while because it was so beautiful, the sense of peace and of comfort and security. It was as if he said this, if I can, there were no verbal words that we heard. It was as if Jesus said to you, you don't need them and you don't need their money. You need me. And as long as I am here, I'll bring comfort and peace to you. What they had to say were the words of men. They are brute beasts because their hearts are not right with me. Let them be. They're mine. They're my children. I'll take care of them the way they need to be taken care of. You simply keep trusting me. That church today... I had the opportunity of helping install their new pastor and that new pastor has helped grow that church. The church has grown larger than it was in any of its time in its history. Beautiful things are happening in the church. Is it the pastor that did it? Was it our prayers that did it? No. It was the Lord Jesus being who he is. Now, I could go back and say, why did you let us go through all this? That was a horrible experience. I have never, I have gone to the doors of lost people and tried to come in to visit and they have called me everything in the world and cussed at me and told me to get off their property. All of us have experienced things like that in this world or perhaps by somebody even in our family treating us that way. I thought, Lord, why do we have to go through this? Why didn't you show up earlier? And just pick them by the lapels and throw them out the door. This is the way he has designed to do it. He works through us and even through our sufferings and through our difficulties. He wants history and our mystery, our story to come together and to work together. It still works that way. It still works that way. God still brings peace and comfort and help in spite of all the things that happen. Let's thank him for it in these moments. Lord, we love you. We want to thank you for the way in which you do appear. Even when men become brute beasts, they function as they're functioning. Even those who are in the world, in the world scene right now, all the brute beasts that are fighting each other. Lord, what we pray is that you will help us in being patient and waiting on you, doing our best in serving you and even enduring the sacrifices and the suffering that goes with it. And Lord, you know how much the Ukrainian people are suffering and how much they're having to face right now and facing brute beasts. What we pray is comfort. Comfort for them, comfort for us. Give us direction, Lord Jesus. Show us which way you're taking us. Show us what our calling is. We love you. In these next few moments, as music plays with your head bowed, you just take a few moments and ask God that same thing. Lord, what is your calling to me? What am I supposed to be doing? What do you want me to be doing to bring comfort in this chaotic place that is called the world?
I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their dark bright, who will bear my light to them, whom shall I Oh 